In this lecture, I will be looking at what happens to a Schottky junction when the semiconducting side is heavily doped. If you increase the doping level in the semiconductor for a Schottky diode, the mechanism for electron conduction across the junction changes. In a Schottky diode, that mechanism is thermal activation. But if we make the doping really heavy, the conduction mechanism will become tunneling. Let's take a look at that. First, let's start with the Schottky diode where you have the metal and the n-type semiconductor in physical contact. They're in equilibrium, meaning no current is being pushed through, so that the Fermi energy needs to be continuous and horizontal all the way across. And the metal only needs to have the Fermi energy shown for its spent energy level diagram, because all electrons are filled up up to the Fermi energy, and that's about all we need to think about right now. On the semiconductor side, the Fermi energy needs to continue through if we're in thermal equilibrium, and that sets then the levels for the conduction and valence bands, because we can calculate where they need to be from equation 185. We have known uh, differences between the Fermi energy and the conduction and valence band edges, but they bend up near the, the junction. And when they bend up, a depletion region forms at the junction, and that's the thing to, to keep in mind is, okay, depletion region means it's depleted of carriers, electrons. So electrons are not there, meaning they've been chased away, meaning that the potential energy has gotten higher in the depletion region. So that's how you remind yourself that in the junction, the n-type will have its bands bending upward so that uh, electrons can be chased out of the depletion region. So that's what it looks like for Schottky barrier. The place where the conduction band edge meets the metal, the, the height of the conduction band edge is the Schottky barrier energy above the Fermi energy. So this difference here is the Schottky barrier. And that will always be so. If you change the doping of the semiconductor, it does not change this. It does not change the fact that the semiconductor's conduction band edge has to be at the Schottky barrier height where it is in contact with the metal. Now let's increase that doping, and let's increase it a lot so that it is degenerately doped. Degenerate doping means that you've doped the semiconductor so much that the Fermi energy crashes into a band edge, in this case the conduction band edge, because it's n-type. Knowledgeably dope the, the semiconductor such that the Fermi energy and the conduction band energy are equal in the bulk, that they come to the same place in the bulk. But you still have band bending near the interface, and so the bands still bend upward. Uh, distance, Schottky barrier height, they have to bend upward. But we're near thermal equilibrium, so the Fermi energy needs to be the same all the way across. And so you know that deep in the bulk of the semiconductor, the conduction band edge comes to the exact same place as the metal's Fermi energy. For a little bit here, n near the junction, that conduction band edge has to bend up to give rise to the depletion region. The else band edge does the exact same thing. Now let's bias this structure. So with the voltage placed like this, and the forwarded bias, meaning that the negative voltage is placed on the n-type. If this were a p-type semiconductor, we would be putting the positive voltage on it for forward bias, but let's but do this. So it's forward biased, you have the negative voltage over here. If you put a negative potential at this input, that chases the electrons away from the type on the semiconductor. So electrons are, which let's just say, less comfortable in the in the n-type semiconductor when it's biased with the negative terminal there, meaning the band edges have to move up. So energy goes up. Higher energy means you don't want to be there. That's how you remember that a negative voltage here chases the electrons away, meaning a negative voltage here causes the energy inside this n-type to go up. So up it goes. And how far does it go up? Q times V is the potential energy you're literally adding over here, and so it goes up an amount Q times V. But at the place where the semiconductor and the metal meet, the conduction band edge has to be at the Schottky barrier height above the Fermi energy. That's the idea of a Schottky barrier. What that means physically, I'll just remind you, is that if you have an electron in the metal and it wants to go into the semiconductor, it needs to overcome an energy height barrier of Q times phi sub n, the Schottky barrier height. So you can get it to, into the semiconductor by giving it that much of a kick. Now, if an electron is in the semiconductor and wants to go into metal, it clearly it doesn't need quite such a kick. It only has to overcome this much, this much energy. So that's what we're going to focus on here. 
to keep our bias on here. And now let's start looking at the current that's going through here. Let's follow the electrons, actually, because the current's going clockwise. Let's follow the electrons. They're going counterclockwise through the end type into the metal. But this is what the band energy diagram looks like. The, the electrons, we'll just consider them to be at an energy level of E sub C at the conduction band edge. If you have an electron at E sub C, it still has a barrier, so it still can't get into the metal. The voltage only accomplishes this much improvement of, of the situation. It moves the energy of the conduction electrons up by an amount QV, which is still not enough. The electrons will accumulate over here, but they won't be able to get over to the metal. Unless this barrier is so thin, they can tunnel through. And that's, in fact, what happens. Remember, if you have a really heavy doping, that means a really narrow depletion region. And so this barrier becomes very thin for very heavy doping. And so tunneling becomes a possibility. And so let's talk about that. How that tunneling happens, remember, we came up with an expression for the probability that an electron will tunnel through a barrier based on how wide the barrier is and how high the barrier is. So you may want to go back and just briefly take a look at the origin of this expression, but we're, we're just going to use this expression now. And we need to talk about a couple of things. We need to talk about, well, what is T? And we need to talk about what is this energy here. Q, V, H minus E is what we called it in the last lecture. We need to know what we write there. So let's talk about that first. So that's the barrier height that an electron needs to overcome. The idea was you had an electron of energy E, and you had a barrier of height Q, V sub H, the energy to be overcome was that difference. So here we'll say we have electrons of energy E sub C and this barrier height, what do they have to overcome? This energy, Q times the Schottky barrier, P sub BN, minus Q times V, because QV is where the conduction band edge is. So we'll replace Q V sub H minus E in this expression with Q times the Schottky potential minus V. So now let's talk about the thickness of the barrier. It's a little more awkward. It's shaped strangely. So what's usually done as a first order approximation is instead of using the T in this expression, use half the depletion width. That's considered to be to pretty much capture the effect, at least to first order. And so that's what we will do. We'll use, we won't use the depletion width. That might be one's first guess. But no, because it's not a step function it's decaying. So use half of it and that'll be well, at least better. So that's what we'll use. So you can put this in for the voltage and we can put this in for the thickness. What do we use for depletion width? That alone is not a, a useful thing. You, you need to know how to calculate it, right? So we go back to chapter 4 where we came up with this expression for the depletion width of a one-sided junction and that's certainly what this is. You have n-type semiconductor only. There's no depletion width in the metal. So uh, we use that expression. Only we put a one half in front of it. So if you need to go back to page 98 right now, pause the video and just go back and look at this and see where it came from. Okay, and multiply by a half. What to use for the potential barrier? It's what we just said we would use. Q times VBN minus V. And so there you go. And N sub D is the doping of the N-type semiconductor. Put this expression in for T put this expression in for the barrier height and you have a mess to simplify so go about doing it. so here we, we put in t that expression and we replace that thing for for energy difference with this do some simplifying and it simplifies down to this so I'll let you do that on your own pause the video again if you need to to, to take a look at that and I use an approximately sign because especially because we really went out of our way to approximate the thickness of the barrier if you know the probability that electrons will tunnel through that barrier that's formed at the junction, we should be able to come up with a current of those electrons. So those electrons are only able to get across because of a really generous voltage assist from the battery. So it's drift current. We're not, we're not sitting around waiting for diffusion to happen. We have J equals N times Q times speed of electrons. But they don't all get through because they bump into the barrier. And so you can apply this probability to that. So that's the, normally the expression for drift current. N times Q times V is the current density. There's a finite probability of each electron actually making it through. And so multiply that by P. So for every electron that goes through, attenuate it by the probability of it actually getting through. 
little n, the number density of electrons is just the doping density. Velocity is linear and, and voltage. But you have this exponential thing we need to take a look at here. Look at a few things. First of all, how does the current depend on voltage and how does the current depend on doping? Let's first talk about voltage. If the voltage is very low, V is a very small number, then it's being overshadowed by the Schottky barrier potential and it doesn't affect anything. So the voltage basically disappears from this exponential when it's small. But when voltage is small, current is, that's not supposed to say independent of, I fixed it, the, the current is depending linearly on voltage through the velocity only. But now when the voltage is high, now your current is this complex relationship. It has this exponential of voltage. And that is very clearly non-ohmic or non-linear. This metal heavily doped semiconductor junction is like a normal conductor at low voltage. It is ohmic. At high voltage, it's non-ohmic. It operates as an ohmic contact at low voltage. Let's look at the contact resistance. And this is possibly your first connection with, with using this quantity. Here's the metal, here's the semiconductor, and there's the junction. There is a resistance associated with that contact. And it's usually reported in ohms per area. There's a dynamic variable. So it's the derivative of voltage with current. So we'll say dV by dJ so that you have ohms per area. Or you could say dV by dI and just have ohms. I can do dj by dv because we have an expression for j, a function of voltage. So you take the derivative of that function, invert it, and evaluate it at low voltage. Take the limit that voltage is really small. And this is what it looks like for a Schottky barrier. That's the previous lecture. And this is what it looks like for the equation on the previous page. So you may need to go back to the lecture on Schottky barriers to see that this uh, is, is what dv by dj looks like, or rather 1 over dj by dv in the limit that voltage goes to zero. And you can go right back to the expression on the previous slide to see what that 1 over dj by dv at low voltage looks like this. And that's the contact resistance for an ohmic contact, that is for a degenerately doped semiconductor, very heavily doped, as opposed to the contact resistance for a Schottky barrier. Um, which you'll notice has this thermal activation in it. There's no thermal activation in this expression, and that's kind of a big difference. So if I made a graph now of how does the contact resistance depend on the doping, we'll take the logarithm of it. For an ohmic contact, for very heavy doping, its logarithmic behavior will be linear. But the thing I want to bring your attention to is that in the Schottky barrier regime, that is small doping, the contact resistance is independent of the doping level. I mean, it's nowhere in the expression, right? So it levels off. I'll draw the log of contact resistance versus not doping, but one over the square root of doping, all the way from very heavy doping to very light doping. And it makes a continuous transition from being ohmic to being Schottky. And when it's Schottky, the doping level has no effect on the resistance of the junction. Let's summarize the key differences between a Schottky barrier and an ohmic contact. First of all, the Schottky barrier is achieved with very light doping. The ohmic contact with degenerate doping or very heavy doping. The Schottky barrier has a very wide depletion layer because of the low doping. And because of the heavy doping, the ohmic contact has a very narrow depletion layer. The movement of electrons across the junction is by thermal activation in a Schottky barrier and hence we preserve that e to the something over kt, energy over kt in the contact resistance expression. It's by tunneling for a uh, ohmic contact. Tunneling doesn't depend on temperature. <laughs> so you, you didn't see temperature in the expression for contact resistance. The difference between the conduction band and the Fermi band energy is you know large for Schottky, but uh, we're, we're degenerately doped, so small, actually close to zero, or act, if you try to get it as close to zero as possible for an ohmic contact. So the Schottky barrier diode provides rectification. What that means is one-way conduction. It's a diode, as opposed to an ohmic contact, which is ohmic. It's not a diode. It functions like a resistor. You know, back and, regardless of the direction of, of the flow, you will actually get the same current going. So it's ohmic in nature as opposed to rectifying.
The Schottky Barrier has a lot of capacitance to it, and we talked a little bit about it. We're going to talk about it a lot more as we go into MOSFETs. And ohmic contacts are ideally low and have no capacitance, but what capacitance is there is parasitic, which we're also going to spend some time talking about. The Schottky Barrier is applied to the gate in a field effect transistor, as opposed to the ohmic contacts, which are used for the source and drain in a field effect transistor. Make a note of this one, because once we get to Chapter 6, this is just going to be kind of a, a, a thing to, that needs to be known, needs to be understood as we talk about the structure of a field effect transistor, that the gate is a Schottky junction and the source and drain are ohmic contact. Let's stop it with uh, with that, and I have an example problem coming up that we'll do next.